friends, and welcome to the amazing Health Summit. I want to welcome those who are joining us online on the various television networks across the country and around the world. Thank you for being a part of this special summit. I'd also like to welcome those who braved the stormy weather to come out tonight and join us here in person. Thank you for being here. Now, we've been looking forward to this Health Summit for a number of months in pre preparing for this. We've had a chance to meet with some excellent speakers, and they'll be sharing some very practical and useful information for you. My name is Jean Ross. I work with the Amazing Facts International Ministry. I'm also one of the pastors here at the Hilltop Church. And I did have some announcements, some things that are important for this upcoming weekend. I hope you all received, those who are here in person, received uh, a little flyer like this on your way in. On the back, it lists uh, the schedule for the whole weekend. You'll all also notice a little QR code in the uh, bottom right corner. Now, that's kind of special. If you take your phone and you put it on camera and you put it over that QR card, you'll, give, you'll have an opportunity to, to tap the link. It'll take you to our Q&A page. You don't have to register. You don't have to put in your email or anything like that. Just tap the link. You'll be able to then type your question related to health. You'll also be able to read the questions that other people have posted. You can vote on their questions, and it'll move them up and down. And tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a panel discussion. We're going to have all of our speakers up here on the stage, and they'll be answering your questions related to health. And so take advantage of that. You've got this evening, of course, all of tomorrow to post your health question. And we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. Also want to remind you, we do have a free gift that we'd like to give you. For those who are here in person, we will have this available at the end of the program this evening. It is one of Amazing Facts' more popular magazine called Amazing Health Facts. And this is absolutely free. It's yours. We'll give it to you as you leave. For those who are watching online, if you'd like to receive this uh, free gift, all you'll need to do is text the word wholesome to the number 40544, or you can visit afsummit.org. Again, text the word wholesome to 40544, or visit afsummit.org. Again, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Doug Batchelor, speaker and president of Amazing Facts. He is going to introduce our speaker for this evening and open our program with a word of prayer. I snuck up behind him. Good evening, friends. So glad to see each of you here and want to welcome those who are also watching either online or on AFTV. And uh, we're having a blizzard in Northern California, so I really appreciate all the Eskimos that came out. Uh, during this program, I know Pastor Ross, he had to put on his snowshoes just about to get down here tonight. We sure appreciate that. But we've got an exciting weekend ahead of us. Uh, during this amazing health summit, we're going to be talking about how you can have longer, stronger life. And you're also going to be having more life, better quality, and learning how to have a more abundant life. And so we're going to be dealing with the the physical and the mental and the spiritual aspects of health with a, a biblical foundation. Now, I don't want to take any more time away from our presenter. Uh, Dr. Laren Tan is going to be sharing with us in our first presentation. He's going to be talking, in essence, about healthy habits, but I'll let him introduce that. Uh, Dr. Tan is the Associate Professor of Medicine and serves as Chair for the Department of Medicine in Loma Linda. He's Assistant Dean of Continuing Medi uh, Medical Education for Loma Linda University School of Medicine, Medical Director of Loma Linda University, Faculty Medical Group Creative Innovation, Communication and Branding, Creator and Director of Loma Linda University Comprehensive Program for Obstructive Airway Diseases, and the Associate Director for Loma Linda University Health Advanced Lung Disease Center, and that's one third of his introduction, but I'm gonna stop there. He, he's extremely, uh, well qualified and as Karen said he's a, a friend of our family he and his wife Heidi have three children and um, we're just so thankful that Dr. Tan is here going to be sharing uh, also a friend uh, helped me quite a bit when uh, I had COVID about a year ago which we sure appreciate and um, so we're going to be blessed I know tonight let's begin with a word of prayer Father in heaven we believe that you draw near in a special way when your people come together to seek your face and to better understand your will. We know that Jesus came and he wants us to have life and life more abundantly. And we pray that we'll be blessed in a special way through this presentation and those that will follow 
that we might be uh, draw closer to you and, and learn how to experience better health and to share that with others as well. We thank you and consecrate this time to your glory and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can join me by giving a good amen as we welcome Dr. Tan. That's right. Thank you. You know, I know it's cold, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's a blessing. Um, and I think for, for many things, there are a lot of things that go on in life, and, and sometimes things that we don't think, you know, such as the cold air, um, could actually be helpful in other areas. And so I, I'm thankful for that. I am humbled and honored to actually be here, um, especially as, as one of the panel speakers. To be able to be following or even in front of Daniel and Jessica Vera, Dr. Neil Nedley, Dr. Binus, and Pastor Doug. I know that we've got a powerful lineup coming up. And as what Pastor Doug has stated, uh, it's really not about what I've done. I feel it's really more about where God has led and where God continues to lead his people. And, and I am humbled to be able to be part of that. There, it's, this is going to be a two-part series. Um, I'm going to be sharing at least two pillars of six key lifestyle practices uh, and I believe the other speakers, especially Pastor Doug, will be actually highlighting a lot of what I'll be going over. But I think that there's power in repetition, and I hope that you'll bear with me, as, as, uh, especially as we talk about more about these things tomorrow. Um, before we begin, I just ask that you will pray for me, and let's just bow our heads just one more time. Lord, I just ask that your words will be heard. I pray that there are so many out there that are hurting and, and just need your help. And I just ask that, that you will somehow just intervene. I thank you for this moment. May you and only you be honored and glorified. Amen. So as you can see, um, there's going to be actually up on, on, actually, we can say what my, my talk's going to end up being. It's going to be the power of what if and could have in prevention. As, as what Pastor Doug had previously stated, uh, I am a pulmonologist. I'm basically, I'm a lung doctor, but I also specialize in those that are really ill. So I'm also a critical care specialist. Um, aside from serving many wonderful physicians back at Loma Linda as the chair of the Department of Medicine, um, I also want to take this moment to be able to say that today is Thank a Resident Physician Day. I don't know if many of you knew, or, or perhaps you may have a niece, a nephew, or your, your child is, in, is a resident right now, but February 24th is thanks a, a, a resident physician day. So I just wanted to thank all our resident physicians out there. And the reason why I'm saying this is because my journey after being a resident at Loma Linda started here in Sacramento when I was a pulmonary and critical care fellow at UC Davis. And it was actually being at UC Davis that led us to be able to be better acquainted at, at then Sac Central, um, then Granite Bay, and, and by God's grace, here we are, right? And so this has definitely been a journey, and Sacramento has always been a second home to me and also our family. But the journey continues. And as I was preparing for this talk and also looking at, at the title, I asked, well, God, how, how can I actually present what needs to, what you want to actually be heard? And, and something popped up on my phone. I don't know about you, but on your cell phone, do you have something that comes up and it says, one year ago, this picture comes up, I'm seeing a lot of yeses, right? And it says, and you can slide through and, and see what that memory actually was. I'm going to share with you what popped out just earlier this month. And it was February 10th, two years ago to this date. Now, I, I know the picture may be small, but, but bear with me on this. This photo was sent to me on February 10th, and it, and it was actually taken actually back in December of 2021. And of course, you can see that in this picture, there is, in the middle, there's actually a patient laying there, and to the left is a respiratory therapist. And holding that patient's hand is a nurse, our intensive care unit nurse, and that's me in the back to the right. And this picture was taken by the LA Times during a very, very difficult time. Of course, this was during the COVID-19 surge. It's tough, right? And, and I just by a raise of hands, how, how many maybe personally or you knew somebody that was actually affected by COVID-19, right? I mean, it, and even till this day, I think there's still a lot that's going on. But as I look at that and as that memory 
popped up on my phone, I reflected on three different things. The first one is, we need to prepare the world for Christ's second coming, amen? The second was more personally, perhaps for me, which is, Lord, please come soon. The third is that there is such great work that needs to be done to prevent illness, because in that little small phrasing right there, it states that the ICU patients that we were seeing time and time again before we were placed on life support, which was what we were about to do, were patients who had multiple health issues. And of those health issues, how many were preventable? And that, that I felt was where the Lord wanted me to be able to take this to. And so it's so timely that we're talking about this. Now the next three slides I'm gonna share with you, I promise you, are really just, that's it. Like, it, it's only gonna be just the data slides. Now you know I'm a true academic person because it's a lot of information, the font's very small. But bear with me on this because this is a slide that shows from the CDC all the various different, we could say, high risk comorbidities or health illnesses that led to a more or worse outcome when you actually got COVID-19. Now, we're not gonna go through all of this, but I just wanted to be able to highlight that of those, cerebral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes type two, coronary vascular disease, obesity, smoking, and as I'm naming these things, you can't help but think, aren't some of these things preventable? Aren't some of these things that, we, that I'm mentioning, if we actually had a better lifestyle, we could actually prevent? And I get that. There are some things that are out of control, but some things just really are in our control. Now, is this only unique to us? What was it in, in Canada? Again, similarly, the same thing. And what is, I would want to note more on this, is that you see these tiny little dots. And basically, the farther the dot is to the right, the more likely you were going to end up dying from COVID if you had these comorbidities or different health illnesses. And again, it's very small, but COPD, high blood pressure, diabetes type 2, chronic kidney disease, liver diseases. You're getting kind of the theme on this? Is this a North American problem? Perhaps it's only just us. That's not the case. It was the same thing also in Europe. And again, the same diseases kept popping up. This is a global thing, right? And so the message that we have as a church, again, applies to everyone, not just here in Sacramento, not just in the United States, but globally. And so the point is, when we ask, how much can I do, right? Especially when it comes to actually preventing perhaps these health illnesses. Now, by following these six lifestyle practices, imagine this, you can reduce your risk of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and some cancers by up to 70 to 90%. Now, you see that these are the six lifestyle practices. I, I am gonna be able to only just target today, I'm gonna be talking about healthy living and healthy, some of the habits, and that's gonna be what, uh, along, along lines of avoid risky substances, and tomorrow, I'll be talking a little bit more about physical activity. But I suspect the rest of the speakers after me and even tomorrow will be touching all of this. And I, and I think that is really in tune with our health message. So the three key points, right? The prevention of health-related diseases requires healthy living, healthy choices, and a healthy lifestyle. And to achieve these three things, I believe we actually need a team. But before I even tell you a little bit more about the team and where the inspiration also came from, I wanted to share with you this text. Right? Without counsel, plants go array, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 15, verse 22. Now, why am I sharing this with you? And that is because through fervent prayer, I was, I was, telling, I was asking and really just praying, Lord, I have been trained to actually take care of patients that were on the brink of death. My training is not primarily focused on the prevention of things, but actually trying to save those on the brink of death. And who you needed, Lord, someone to speak in front of you today was really someone who was more equipped to talk about prevention. And the Lord answered this prayer. He, he led me to actually this team here. In the back, you will see, is, is, a, is really a friend, um, is the Department Chair of Preventive Medicine at Loma Linda, is Dr. April Wilson. To the right of her is Rosa Casares. In the front, Sylvia, Sylvia Kramer, Glendy Chen, and then Christina Reyes. 
And why I'm sharing you with this is because it just so happened April and I connected and she said, Laren, what's going on? And I said, April, I'm struggling. I, I need help. And she said, we've got this program. Did you know that? Like a lot of things, no. But when she told me this, it just fit right in. And I felt it was an answered prayer. And so tonight, I'm so excited to be able to share with you, tonight and tomorrow also, a little glimpse of what the Health 180 program is about, and also that it's been validated to actually work in preventing a lot of health diseases. So amazing team that you see before you, but the man before you that you see up in front of this stage is far from perfect. I am not the man that, that, is, that will exemplify all six lifestyle principles. I, where, and the point is that while I think and believe that I've done well in certain areas, I know that I'm weak in other areas. Sleep is really one of the top ones. We've got three children, they're sitting right there. You see them and you'll understand why. But there are a lot of things I think that a lot of us can actually say that we can work on, right? And I'm about to share with you something very personal, and that would make me very vulnerable, but it's okay, because I wanted to be able to reemphasize again that who you see in front is not perfect, and much like you, I realize there's a lot of work to be done, and there's things that we need to keep working on. So what is my personal weakness? And I think on this next one, I'm gonna show with you, and, I, and I'm hoping to see some heads not up and down, because perhaps this is your personal weakness too, especially when it comes to food. So this is my personal weakness. The chocolate donut bar. Do I have any? Yes, see, eh? right? I know, I've seen some already. Yes, we're, see, I love it. This is the crowd, right? I, it is a blessing to be able to have a moment to have such like this, but we know that too much of it is going to be bad. So let's, let's continue on, right? And so what I wanted to be able to share with you is that what if I'd made a better health decision and not eating that donut? Perhaps I could have prevented my weight gain, my diabetes, my high cholesterol, my cardiovascular disease. And I hope that as, you're as you see and I'm going through the various different slides, you will understand at least what I'm trying to conceptualize and perhaps what we can frame within our mind to live a better life. So let's start with something that I know we have all seen, perhaps some of us partake, continue to take, uh, and continue to drink, but we're just not fully aware of, and that is coffee. Now, whew, I know I heard that, thank you. Now, it's not necessarily coffee, right? What I'm focusing on really is caffeine, right? And, and, and I think that we all realize that while caffeine has some beneficial effects, that when high consumption of coffee with a lot of caffeine can actually decrease bone density, and that's something that not a lot of people actually are aware of. Now, what is high consumption? High consumption ranges, right? But if you look at the medical literature, it can go up to half a cup to three cups a day. Anything greater than three cups is considered more, or really high consumption. And when we say cups, we're talking about eight ounces, right? I know in, here in the United States, we like to go big. No, no, eight ounces is a cup, right? Some people have told me, this is my cup. No, no, that's, that's a little too much. And the thought of why it is, and you may not have been aware, is that by high consumption of coffee could actually lead, at least the caffeine itself, to block these adenosine receptors. And adenosine receptors are actually needed, and because of this, it may inhibit bone formation, it actually increases bone reabsorption, it can actually affect the way vitamin D is metabolized, and as a result, your bone density, the strength of your bone, can actually get less and weaken. And we know that as you age, Osteoporosis is something we have to be worried about. Caffeine withdrawal is also real, right? We know that caffeine is actually used to actually treat headaches. And so by taking away the caffeine, it can actually result in headaches. And these are things that, that when we try to think, are we gonna take ourselves off if we're actually drinking a lot of caffeine, it is good to be able to recognize what's gonna be inhibiting us to be able to actually take off the caffeine. And then also, what do you put in your coffee or your tea? We know that there's a lot of various different things that you can put into coffee to make things flavorful, and a lot of those things are actually unhealthy. And I know that there's a new mindset, and it is not what you put into coffee, it's what coffee is put into, right? Meaning you're drinking more of the creamer than actually the coffee. So these are, are different things, and, and I think this was a great way to build a segue into something, another habit that has affected many lives, and that is alcohol. 
Alcohol, like many things in life, has profound effects on the person drinking it and also those around them. How many in the audience know someone that's either been hurt or killed from alcohol? Again, it's very similar, to, almost down to COVID, right? You know, I, I want to share with you a story, but I know in the interest of time, but I'll make it quick, that one of the nurses that was in the bedside in that picture was actually driving to work to save more lives and was actually hit by a drunk driver. By the grace of God, he's actually alive, but it's senseless. And this is what made me think of, is, of, of him as I was actually preparing for this presentation too. So perhaps the issue, at least with alcohol, some have actually told me is really the amount, but that's not necessarily the case. If you look at the standard drink, whether it's 12 fluid ounces, eight to nine fluid ounces of malt liquor, five fluid ounces of table wine, or even one and a half fluid ounces shots of 80 proof spirits, the amount of alcohol remains the same all across the board. And how you can tell, you just multiply the volume by the percent of alcohol. You can see the volume actually went down and the percent alcohol actually went up. Of note, I mean, Pastor Doug has stated this in the past, and I don't know if you've heard it, but when we think about, let's say, 1.5 fluid ounces shot of 80 proof spirits, you have to consider what spirits are we actually talking about. I'm certain it's not the Holy Spirit, right? So maybe it's not the volume. Maybe it's the frequency or moderation, right? And, and what is moderation? Well, medical literature actually states, well, this is what moderate use of alcohol actually is. And it differs from male to female. Either it's one drink per day for females or two drinks per day for males, up to seven drinks per week for females and up to 14 drinks per week for males. Anything over these amounts is considered heavy. Uh, and any drinks really greater than four in one setting is considered as being drink, being binge drinking. Now, the reason why that, at least for males, you're able, they're able to actually have more drinks is because we found that males have more gastric alcohol dehydrogenase, the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. Does it mean we're smarter? Absolutely not. It just means that we break down alcohol faster. But it is important that really the point of all of this is really that moderation, is moderation really healthy for you? And I'm gonna actually show you a more recent uh, recommendation of the World Health Organization that actually will, will tell you that it doesn't matter and regardless of whatever you're actually drinking in moderation, it is still unhealthy for you. So the question is, really, there are a lot of various different questions, at least with alcohol, right? Is alcohol use associated with cancer? What about pancreatitis? And is there actually a magical chart that will answer everybody's questions? The answer is no, there isn't. Because for each person, it's actually going to be different. And the takeaway is that although there's been what we've cited, a lot of various different studies talking about alcohol perhaps having some positive effects, I'll reiterate this again. Those were observational studies. There's nothing concrete. So how about you? Right? More importantly, I'm sure some of you have actually heard about, let's say, red wine containing antioxidants or anti-inflammatory compounds called polyphenolics. That's a, that's a mouthful, right? But interestingly enough, these positive things, these compounds that they have so much touted are actually really high in dark grapes, peanuts, dark chocolate, blueberries, strawberries, and other fruit and plant sources. And when I read that it was in dark chocolate, I knew that was the reason why it was okay to actually eat chocolate donut bars, right? That must have been it. I'm being silly, I know. But again, things that God has created that's natural, far, far, far better than anything that we can try to actually do. And I think that is what we're gonna be really emphasizing this coming week, this weekend. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee you. James 4, verse 7. Especially in the context of alcohol, where mindset, clarity of thought, and control of self is significantly depressed. Time and time, that has been shown. So let me also share with you what was just recently published, and what I stated by the World Health Organization. This was published on January 4th of this year. Now, as you read up there, I'm going to read a little bit of something what I've actually put down here, and, and, I, and, I, and I think this will, well, I'm hoping it'll take it, 
to where you will better understand. It is the alcohol that causes harm, not the beverage. Alcohol is toxic, psychoactive, and dependence-producing. It has been classified as a Group 1 carcinogen, or cancer-causing, by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. This was decades ago. Now, Group 1 is the worst, the most severe that you have out of the four groups. Okay? This is the highest group, which also includes asbestos, radiation, and tobacco. Alcohol causes at least seven types of cancer, including the most cancer types, such as bowel cancer and female breast cancer. Ethanol, or alcohol, causes cancer through biological mechanisms as the compound breaks down in the body, which means that any beverage containing alcohol, regardless of its price and quality, poses a risk of developing cancer. So perhaps it's about the amount, right? Well, to identify a safe level of alcohol consumption, valid scientific evidence would need to demonstrate that at and below a certain level, there is no risk of illness or injury associated with alcohol consumption. The new World Health Organization statement clarifies currently available evidence cannot indicate the existence of a threshold at which the cancer effects of alcohol switch on and start to manifest in a human body. So we don't know what that level is, right? So moreover, there are no studies that would demonstrate that the potential beneficial effects of light and moderate drinking on cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes outweigh the cancer risk associated with the same levels of alcohol consumption for individual consumers. I, this, is, this is revolutionary for them to come out so strong by the World Health Organization. And it attests, again, to many of the things that our health message has been pushing out for so many years. So what are other negative effects, right, aside from what I've actually just talked about? Well, we've seen this. We hear this. Violence associated to alcohol, the addiction to alcohol, the accidents that I've just mentioned, the coping mechanisms, where alcohol is a coping mechanism. We know it's not a, it's not a helpful, it's a harmful coping mechanism. Right? And it helps us to be able to just think about the loneliness and how that actually doesn't help out. Excessive alcohol use responsible, is responsible for 88,000 deaths per year and 250 billion in associated costs, loss of workplace productivity, and imagine all the families that have been broken too. So how do we apply what I've mentioned so far about alcohol? If you currently don't drink, don't start. If you do drink, just quit. And if you have a problem, know that there's so much help for you. It just takes a lot of work. It's going to take time. But know that there is help for you. And more importantly, as what I always like to say, just it is an opportunity to talk to your primary care physician or your healthcare professional to actually get the help. Before moving on past alcohol, to something to the next habit I'm going to talk about, I wanted to end with this biblical text. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. In today's society, it's hard to focus. There's so much noise, right? Again, with alcohol, the inhibition to control and have clarity of thought is what the enemy wants. So let us be vigilant. I know I have a hard time trying to focus on things, and I can't imagine being under the influence of alcohol and still trying to control myself. So another habit that has significant health impact is cigarette smoking. Now I know a lot of us know a lot more about cigarette smoking, right? It's a leading cause of preventable deaths in the U.S., 480,000 per year and 41,000 deaths due to secondhand smoke. Everything that smoke touches from the mouth all the way down towards the end of your lungs can cause cancer. There's systemic effects, heart disease, the number one cause of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as lung constipation, and perhaps if we've got another time, I'll talk to you more about that, right? But we know that this is, this is really, and for a very long time, we know that this is one of those also habits that really shouldn't, we shouldn't start, and if you have started, you should quit. But there's something else, something else that's on the horizon, and I think a lot of us have started to see this out in public, and that's vaping. 
And while vaping is not a combustible form, right, meaning we're burning something, there is a heating element. And that heating element, when touched with some liquid form, forms a vape. And that is actually what is that vapor that's actually produced. But there is a lot of harmful things in that vapor, including nicotine, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds. And what do we even say some cancer-causing agents? There are videos out there and reports out there that the battery packs for vapes have actually ignited and exploded too, causing burn injury. So, and then also most recently, I think we saw in the news about vape-induced lung injury, and that is real. Right? And that had to deal with an additive for vapes, because that was not well controlled. So what are we role modeling? What do we want to role model, especially as we see vaping continue to increase with, teen with our teenagers? It's increased significantly in middle school and high schoolers. Where this is really, really, I say concerning, in addition to just having three young children myself, is that nicotine is so addictive and we have seen that nicotine being given at a very young age can actually affect the way the brain develops. And if you can imagine having someone in middle school already addicted to nicotine moving throughout the rest of their life, that is not a good setup, right? Let alone how do we help our teenagers actually quit nicotine, right? Or quit the vape. A single pod right, depending upon what it is they're actually vaping, vaping can actually contain the same amount of 20 cigarettes, that's one pack of cigarettes. It is, it is extremely concerning, and that is the reason why, as a health community, and as a community as a whole, we need to continue to be vigilant and continue to keep fighting against this. So if it's not tobacco smoke or nicotine, how about medical marijuana? To your left, you can see all the alleged conditions that, it, that they've been touted it actually treats. But what isn't actually stated are the concerning parts, right? One out of 10 users become addicted. Any use while brain is developing, much like nicotine, has a negative consequences. When smoke, it contains many of the carcinogens as cigarettes. Why? Because it was combusted, right? It was burning. The acute effects of smoking mar med medical marijuana, or THC itself, is anxiety, paranoia, memory, lack of motivation, learning deficits. And then long-term effects, we've seen and something such as cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, where a condition that leads to repeated severe bouts of vomiting, that's because of the marijuana. All these things, and I think that that is where we need to weigh, right? We need to be able to think, is this really worth it? We know that there's really no medical benefit to this. In a lot of ways, sure, it's been proposed, but I think there are other ways to be able to treat those, at least conditions that have been stated on the left. We also know that chronic marijuana use can produce a lot of lung problems, and I see this personally time and time again. It's the cough, it's the wheeze, I can't breathe, a lot of sputum production. And that is because the THC itself affects the bronchial epithelial ciliary chain, right? It's not able to actually clear the mucus, and actually all the smoke causes more irritation. We know that by stopping marijuana smoking, all of this is reversible, which is fantastic. The lung changes in marijuana are similar, but not really exactly the same as those of tobacco smoke. And at this time, there isn't a clear association between marijuana and lung cancer, but I'd like to say that we're at a stage very early, and that really it's not conclusive really at this time whether or not that marijuana will lead to lung cancer. Then there is CBD, right? I think a lot of us have actually seen this supplements to actually try to treat pain, anxiety, and other symptoms. As of right now, the only FDA-approved CBD component or product is actually for seizures, nothing else. And if you can see, it's hard to be able to tell what is the quality, what is the amount. We're not too sure exactly who's validating what is being stated on that label. And CBD also carries a lot of risk. It is well tolerated, but there are side effects such as dry mouth, diarrhea, reduced appetite, drowsiness, fatigue, and also CBD can interact with a lot of medications, especially with blood thinners. So we have found, you know, we've actually focused a little bit on tobacco, marijuana smoke, and what I'd like to be able to take a moment now is for us to be able to breathe. I hope for those that, that are able to, let's, let's practice, right? Let's sit straight, let's sit up straight, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in through our nose, and we're going to hold our breath for five seconds and then exhale all the way out. You ready? Breathe in through your nose. Let's do it. And let's breathe out with the mouth. Didn't that feel great? I did that exercise to be able to test who was actually sleeping during this con, all right? And so I, I think I caught a couple of you, so. But it's okay, it's all right. This is a great exercise, especially when we're, when we're actually breathing in clean air. But when we're not breathing in clean air, that becomes a problem too, right? According to the World Health Organization, 4.2 million premature deaths worldwide in 2016 occurred because of outdoor air pollution. The combined effects of ambient air and household air pollution are associated with 6.7 million premature annual deaths. Air pollutants is something that I think some of us can't avoid, but for many of us, really can't, just based upon where we live. I'm going to show you this next slide, and, and I know it's small, but I'm hoping you'll be able to see it. This is the American Lung Association State of the Air 2022 report. I've highlighted Sacramento, and I also want to highlight San Bernardino. And you can see that our grade there is F. And F does not stand for fantastic in this sense, right? So we realize that there's a lot of work to be done. But we've already, we're kind of, I guess, stuck in a lot of ways from, from the type of air we're actually breathing. So what can we actually do, right? Because there are some families, like this report that was actually published by Loma Linda's uh, School of Public Health, where Dr. Spencer Huang and team in 2019 published uh, the Association of Major California Freight Rail, Rail Yards with Asthma-Related Pediatric Emergency Department Hospital Visits. And it was very interesting what they actually found, right, with air particulates. Children living less than 10 miles from a freight rail yard were at significantly greater risk of using the emergency room for asthma than those living more than 10 miles away. The second thing they actually found was that within that 10-mile radius, those that were further out, 5 to 10 miles, we're actually seeking more medical treatment than those actually living closer than the five-mile radius. And the thought is that, at least what Dr. Spencer Huang thought, is, the, the proposed reason is that this locomotive particulates are lighter than air and higher, and they fly higher in higher temperatures. And that's the reason why it kind of skips that five-mile radius. And the reason why I'm sharing you this is that where we live, and especially with the wildfires that actually happen, have profound effects, especially on our lung health and the health, overall well-being of us. And so what can we actually do, especially for those that can't afford to move or perhaps buy a home filtration system? Well, this is one way. This is not something that we created at Loma Linda by any means. This is the, the Corsi Rosenthal box, and it's a do-it-yourself method to be able to build your own home, we could say home filtration. And, and it's, it's been helpful especially helped out during wildfires, especially with patients who had COVID um, or post-COVID. And, and it's just something I just want to share with you that there are different ways for us to be able to try to have cleaner air at home without breaking the bank. In addition to actually clean air, it is extremely important that we continue to also get appropriate sunlight, right? Um, I know it's hard today, but there are many days I know being here in Sacramento where we've got a lot of sun. But it's really just getting the right amount of sun, right? Getting the right amount of sun helps our skin to make vitamin D. It resets our timing with melatonin synthesis. It improves our mood. Um, and of course, really, what is the goal? 10 to 30 minutes a day, non-burning exposure. Sunblock is okay. I had to read up quickly more on, on the sunblock. Does that affect your vitamin D synthesis within the skin? And so far, there's, there's no compelling strong evidence to support that putting sunblock impedes us from actually being able to produce more vitamin D. But it is important, right? And I, and I would say we would pair this with actually exercise too. So we definitely want to do this on a day where there's clean air. But in addition to clean air, it's also important to drink clean water. And I would say, at least within Sacramento, I was trying to read up on the report on the amount of clean uh, for water, and, and it's great. I think it's, it's fantastic. It's much better than San Bernardino. And how much, right? How much clean water? Well, for those areas that, that actually, you know, we could say, if you want, you can consider getting a water filter. Get enough water. Um, for men, it's about 15 and a half cups. For females, it's 11 and a half cups per day. 
That was a lot of cups. And this is eight ounces, right? Remember that again. And then two glasses upon waking and between meals. And then again, ideally, plan to drink 30 minutes before a meal or wait 45 minutes after for optimal digestion. So really, in summary, there are numerous things that we can do to live a healthier life. It is going to take a lot of work. And I know that I've really just touched on many various different aspects, and I thought it was important and perhaps a great introduction as we go throughout Amazing Facts Health Summit. And I'm sure that many other speakers will come after me to be able to focus more on various, various different specific aspects on the six lifestyle practices. Once again, this is just to highlight and thank the team. And if you've got any questions, you can email them or even call them. But I'd like to be able to end with this and why it's so important for us to continue to live a healthy life. And why is that? For ye are bought with a price, and that price was not cheap, right? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit, not the other proof spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. I want to thank you for your time and your attention and for working through that breathing exercise with me. It was fantastic. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. We sure appreciate that. We're going to have just a brief break. Tell you what we'd like you to do after all that uh, discussion on the things that are healthy. Stand up for a moment. Why don't you all stand up and stretch? And just for a second, you might turn around and say hi to the person around you and ask them how many times they've been in jail. <laughs> no, don't ask that. <laughs>
Are we on? All right, friends. We're going to begin the second half of our program momentarily. And we are recording this on live television, so you may want to find your seats. And we'll be beginning. You'll see the opener roll. And once that starts happening, we are on live TV. So again, we ask you, mute your cell phones and find the best seats. And we'll begin. Welcome, friends, to the Amazing Health Summit. We're so thankful to see each of you here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church and also want to welcome those who are watching on AFTV and YouTube and Facebook and the other outlets. And now is a good time for you to take your phone and text a little message and say, tune in now to the Amazing Health Summit and uh, you will be blessed. We're going to be talking about how you can have a longer, stronger, more abundant life some of the basic principles so that you can just uh, thrive body, mind, and spirit. And we've got just a great lineup of speakers. We just had a wonderful presentation from Dr. Laren Tan. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to have another great presentation. I want to tell you before I introduce my friends that there is a free offer. And I think you'll be uh, entertained by the title. It's called Death in the Kitchen by Pastor Joe Cruz, Death in the Kitchen. And for those who are here, when you leave, the magazine we offered earlier and this book, Death in the Kitchen, will be available for those who are watching online. If you'd like to get a copy, all you have to do is text the word kitchen to 40544. Just text kitchen to 40544, or you can visit afsummit.org and you'll receive that free. And it'll cover some of the material that you'll be receiving in this seminar. Well, in just a moment, we'll have prayer. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenters. Uh, Daniel Vieira, it's Daniel and Jessica Vieira. Daniel is the director of Modern Mana Ministries, and he has grown up surrounded by health ministry and has learned a lot along the way. They operate the Bella Vista Lifestyle Center. Jessica Vieira is a registered nurse, a registered dietitian, and together they're passionate about sharing cutting edge nutrition and lifestyle information with those who are seeking a healthier life. They specialize in detoxification, nutrition, herbal medicine, and hydrotherapy techniques. Their focus is to assist clients in regaining their health by adopting a plant-based diet and following lifestyle programs to reverse disease naturally. Additionally, they enjoy sharing the love of Christ with those eager to know more about his redeeming and his transforming love. In just a moment, we'll bring them up, but I'd like to begin with a word of prayer if you would join me in bowing your heads. Loving Lord, we just pray that in a special way you will be with us now as we come together and learn principles of truth where we can experience optimum health, Lord, in, in serving you and loving you and serving our fellow man. I pray that you'll be with Daniel and Jessica in this presentation. Give them your Holy Spirit and give us ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So join me in welcoming Daniel and Jessica. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? Good. Wonderful. I know your program says two individuals are presenting tonight, but I don't want to confuse you, but my wife is pregnant with our third child. Um, we are looking forward to welcoming a new little boy into this world this coming May. So 
we are really exciting, excited um, for a little child, but also to be here as well. You know, as I imagine the majority of you are aware, there's so many diets out there, right? From the keto diet to the paleo diet to the Jenny Craig diet to the Weight Watchers diet, you name it, there's a diet for it. And what's interesting is we find that a lot of these diets are short-lived. Um, individuals may not be able to receive the results that they're wanting, so they give up. But what's interesting is the Bible talks about diets. Do you know that? It's really interesting, and that's what we're going to jump into tonight. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, we come before you this evening, and we thank you for this health summit. We thank you for your greatness, and we thank you for the information that we have already received. I pray, dear Lord, that as Jessica and I provide this presentation, that we will decrease so you can increase through us, we pray. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at this first diet, we're going to start off at the very beginning of the Bible. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, and which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree, and to you it shall be as meat. So we see that the Bible talks about the herb bearing seed and the fruit of the tree. So it was essentially a fruit and seed diet, right? An amazing diet. And there are healing powers in these foods from the tree plants and from the herb bearing seeds. They are phytochemically rich foods. And what does the word phytochemical mean? So phyto comes from the Greek word phyton, which means plant, and chemical is a compound found in the plant cell walls um, that contain these rich nutrients that help fight off viruses, bacteria, and fungi, or even cell injury. So when a plant gets injured from the weather or for, from pests or insects biting on it, then the plant itself releases these amazing phytochemicals. God is so good, isn't he? So we're going to look at some of these phytochemicals and we're going to take a look at some of the foods as well. So what we see here is glucaric acid. Have you heard of this before? It's really interesting. It's found in oranges and apples and it may inhibit chemical carcinogenesis and prevent heart, prostate, and colon cancer. Isn't that amazing? We also see here anthocyanins. Those are a type of phytochemical found in strawberries, raspberries, cherries, the peel of an eggplant, pomegranates. They are the rich pigments that are red and dark purple, and those help protect the cell walls, protect against cell lipid oxidation, and slow down aging, and help resist disease. They are so beneficial for fighting cancer when humans consume them. And we also find flavonoids found in the citrus fruits, berries. And what's interesting about the flavonoids is they assist in keeping cancer-causing hormones, I'm sorry, they keep cancer-causing hormones from latching onto the cells. Isn't that neat? Mm -hmm. And so we've mentioned the word carcinogen, or that is a substance that is capable of causing cancer. There are naturally occurring carcinogens, such as UV rays in the environment, um, and certain viruses can cause cancer too. And there's certain carcinogens that are man-made, such as auto automobile exhaust, fumes, or cigarette smoke. So we see there's some concerns here, right? And we've looked at the fruits. Mm -hmm. We see the benefits in these fruits. But what about the herb bearing seed? Yes, so the Hebrew word for herb is aseb, and that word means grass or tender shoot. And an herb bearing seed could include, certainly include grains, whole grains. Absolutely, and what's interesting is eating whole 
instead of refined grains. What's really interesting with this is these whole grains will lower the total cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol. And we also see that these whole grains will lower triglycerides and insulin levels. And what's really neat is eating at least two servings of whole grains daily may help to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. So what is an example of a whole grain? Well, one thing I think of is what we eat every morning, usually every morning, oatmeal. That's right. We love oatmeal. Um, we generally have this every morning with a green smoothie as well. And we really feel as if when we start our day, we want to nourish our body as much mm -hmm. as possible. And it lasts us until lunch. It's more filling than boxed cereal, refined grains from cereal. So eating whole grains like um, oats, quinoa, buckwheat, those are, are protein rich, fiber rich, and definitely a lot of health benefits to eating whole Absolutely. grains over refined grains. Now, the herb bearing seed, but what about nuts? I mean, nuts are beneficial, aren't they? Mm, absolutely. Yeah, research has found that frequently eating nuts helps to lower levels of inflammation related to heart disease and diabetes. And the Adventist Health Study actually showed a lot of benefits um, to this population group, to our population group, in when you ate nuts on a regular basis. And there was lower levels of coronary heart disease. That's awesome, isn't it? And mm -hmm. it continues. Yes, regularly eating healthy, a healthy diet that includes nuts can improve artery health, reduce inflammation related to heart disease. It can improve blood pressure. So we, next, next slide. So we really see that God placed Adam and Eve in a garden to assist their health mm -hmm. through these foods that he gave us, Absolutely. which is amazing. Yes, um, nuts, the research continues, it, nuts can help decrease the risk of blood clots, which can lead to heart attack and strokes, and lowers the risk of early death due to heart disease. So there's a lot of benefits to nuts. It can also help lower the LDL or the bad cholesterol and triglycerides, which those things can clog the arteries. Now what about beans and legumes though? Yeah, they're technically, I mean, you plant them. You take the seed, which is the bean, and you can it grows, grow a plant out of it, right? And they're absolutely delicious and healthy and nutritious for us as absolutely. well. Absolutely. So that technically is an herb-bearing seed. And what do we find? So one of the best source, carbohydrate sources, especially if you have diabetes, is consuming beans and legumes. That can help lower cholesterol levels and regulate blood sugars. So the resistant starches and fiber in the bean act almost as like a broom that sweeps those things out of the gut and helps remove excess cholesterol and regulate the blood sugars. So that is definitely um, eating a cup of beans a day, especially if you have diabetes, is so beneficial for your blood sugar health. And including um, these um, eating beans can actually improve the gut bacteria, and so your gut bacteria breaks down the fiber, and it helps create these short-chain fatty acids too, which um, help lower the risk of colon cancer. Um, according to the American Journal of Epidemiology, eating beans, peas, and lentils twice a week has been found to decrease colon cancer risk by 50%. Isn't that amazing? That's great. Yeah. Now, do any of you like brownies? Brownies are good, aren't they? Now, Jessica, she makes a brownie recipe, and you wouldn't guess what the secret ingredient is. Beans. Black beans. Black beans specifically. These are good. Yes, I actually sampled some at a health fair for a hospital one time, and people were pretty surprised at how good it tasted. Um, and knowing that it was made from black beans. <laughs> really nutritious. Now, seeds. Seeds are very beneficial as well, aren't they? Yes. We find that seeds are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. They reduce total cholesterol. They lower blood sugar levels. 
They increase oxygen to the cells and they help joint mobility and bone density as well. Mm -hmm. We find that they balance female hormones, they strengthen the immune system, they have cancer protective compounds, they nourish the hair, the skin, the nails, and they're high in fiber as well. Mm -hmm. And I once came across this incredible study which took two women um, groups, female groups, who had breast cancer tumors, and they gave one of um, the groups some flax seeds in their diet. The other group was the control group. And they did not have any flax seeds in their diet. After the study was completed, they analyzed through biopsy the tumor cells, and they found regression in the tumor cell growth in the group, 70% um, of the group that had flax seeds regularly, daily, in their diet. And Dr. Michael Greger, who wrote the book How Not to Die, he advocates highly for consuming flax seeds every day, at least a teaspoon. So definitely that's something to add to your baking, to your whole grains, your hot cereals. Very important to add flax seeds. Yeah, absolutely. So we've looked at the Genesis 21, Genesis 129 diet, the diet that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden. But then something happened. As we know, Adam and Eve, they were tempted by the serpent and they ultimately sinned and they were cast out of the garden. But what's interesting about this is God provided a more um, abundant or more variety of food for Adam and Eve once they were cast out of the garden. So that's what we're gonna look at here, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And what do we find? Yes, so in Genesis chapter three, it says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Now I want to mention something very interesting. God said, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. He did not say, and dust you shall return um, to heaven, or dust you shall return to a fiery hellhole. No, you return to the ground. And the Bible is clear if we look at the totality of scripture on the state of the dead, that we return to the earth, we sleep when we die, we don't immediately go to a heaven or a hell. And that was something that was introduced by pagan religions that influenced other religions, and a lot of Christian religions somehow have caught on to that, and they believe strongly that you go to heaven or you go to hell once you die. But the dead know nothing. There's, That's true. there's very neither, many verses on neither this. Neither have they any more reward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention, though, that God did not curse the vegetables. Thank the Lord, right? Um, he said he, he cursed the ground mm -hmm. and brought forth thorns and thistles, and you will have to toil and labor in that. So that was the consequence of sin, is that we have to work hard for our food and produce in agriculture, and certainly contend with the pests and the weeds. So that was the curse, not the vegetables. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But what we find is the vegetation here. Mm -hmm. And looking at some of the nutrients in these vegetations, we find that in all three carbonyls found in your cruciferous vegetables, they're absolutely fabulous, and they're great at lowering estrogen and reducing mammary cancers, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. There's so many benefits to cruciferous vegetables. That is a vegetable family I love to talk about. Um, the cruciferous vegetables are your broccoli, your cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Those all trigger the formation of glutathione. That's one of the most potent antioxidants that your body makes, that God instructed your body to make. And that helps block um, carcinogens. It um, helps to reduce inflammation. It helps to enhance the detoxification pathways of the liver. Um, and these are specifically the isothiocyanates that scientists have studied in these cruciferous vegetables. And one of them being sulforaphane. 
right? Sulforaphane is an isothiocyanate found in cruciferous vegetables, but in abundance in the sprouted vegetables, uh, uh, cruciferous vegetables. So there's been a lot of health hype about um, broccoli sprouts, but the literature actually suggests that arugula sprouts, kale sprouts, radish sprouts, all the cruciferous vegetables, when they begin as teeny tiny baby plants, they all have the same potency of sulforaphane that broccoli sprouts do. So you can certainly get away with eating kale sprouts and having benefits just like you do from broccoli sprouts. In fact, they reported 20 to 100 times more potency from these sprouts than the mature vegetable or like the mature head of broccoli. So that helps um, remove carcinogens from the cell. Again, helps with liver detoxification, boosting glutathione, um, lowering inflammation. It's, it's something that is it's just very cool that God placed in oh, these yeah. um, vegetables. And we love to eat a variety of sprouts. Mm -hmm. We will place them on our salads. Yeah. And they're so easy Add them to, to your grow. sandwich, yeah. They're so easy. And we mm -hmm. also find allele sulfides found in garlic, onion, leeks, chives, make carcinogenesis easier to excrete from the body. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in an Italian family, we put garlic on everything. You ate a lot of garlic. We ate a lot of garlic. That was the number one remedy. You pop some garlic cloves in your You know, it's interesting. You can actually yeah. take garlic, a clove of garlic, and you slice off the end of it while it's still in its, its uh, protective husk. You could place that. I've placed it. I'm not telling you what to do, but we've placed it in the ear to kill off the bacteria for an ear infection. Isn't that cool? I mean, using garlic. Mm. So what else do we find here? Just careful, though, because it can burn. The juices That's can, why can you burn. leave it in yeah, the husk. You leave it in yes. the husk. Um, another vegetable that I love to talk about are beets. Beets contain natural nitrates. Those convert to nitric oxide, which deliver oxygen to your tissues, dilates your blood vessel, boosts energy, athletic performance, and endurance. And get this. Free divers that took a shot of beet juice before they dove down, holding their breath, were able to hold their breath for 30 seconds longer after taking beetroot juice. And also cyclists um, who performed at peak performance, when they took some beetroot juice, they were able to um, max out two minutes after their normal regular time of exhaustion. So it really boosts athletic performance and endurance. It's very cool. So you're saying I could ditch the expensive energy drinks. Yeah. <laughs> just, and just and I could attest to this because I have taken beet powder, beet juice before going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And you do, you, you feel as if you could go longer, you get that extra pump mm -hmm. and plants that God made for us. Isn't this wonderful? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I just wanted to add a little disclaimer though. If anyone has had kidney stones, um, related to oxalates. Beets are high in oxalates, so I don't recommend juicing a whole lot of beets and drinking that if you have kidney disease or have had kidney stones that are oxalate kidney stones. Mm -hmm. That's true. So we see something else happened here, right? Mm -hmm. We had Adam and Eve in the garden. They sinned. And then we see the flood happened, right? And as we look at that story, we know that, you know, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and Noah was on the ark with his family. And there was this provisionary diet that they were given, right? Because there wasn't any vegetation on the earth. But the key here is it was a provisionary diet because they didn't have the vegetation. And as we look into this, what we see is Genesis 7 verse 2, of every clean beast thou shalt take <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So what's interesting here is we see that there's a difference between a clean and an unclean as well, right? Mm -hmm. 
And we also see in Genesis 8.20 that Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offering on the altar. So again, we see a clean, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a, a distinction between a clean animal and an unclean animal as well, right? Mm -hmm. We also see in Genesis 9, 3 through 4, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herb, but you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so the question, how could Noah distinguish between the clean and unclean animals? Yeah, so, you know, this is interesting because when we look at Abraham, mm -hmm. in Genesis 15, Abraham was having a discussion, a dialogue with, with God. And Abraham was looking in the night sky and saying, saying, Lord, what about my descendants? And what was interesting here is one of the signs here was that Abraham was to offer up specific animals. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's interesting with this is we find later on in Genesis that these animals were actually clean animals. Mm -hmm. So I believe Abraham knew the distinction between clean mm -hmm. and unclean. Therefore, Noah, I believe, knew the distinction between clean and unclean as well. Yeah, God directed him which animals that would go in. Um, but what about these little racing. friends? Oh. Yeah. What does the Bible say about these cute little animals? It says, their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. And these are scavengers. I mean, they will practically eat anything that is put in front of them, right? Mm -hmm. What about this? Well, continue here. Oh, well, the Bible calls, um, you, you wanted to talk, though, about the lobsters and the crabs, right? Yes, that's right. The Bible calls those an abomination. An abomination. Yeah. And, you know, what's you interesting, to share on, on what's this. interesting is years ago at our family's vegeta vegetarian cooking school, we had a retired fisherman who raised his hand. And he said, hey, I have to tell you guys something. I have been fishing for crabs and lobsters my whole career. And you know when I had my, my best catch? It was early in the mornings, near the docks, right when or right after the boats would release their sewage tanks. These, they're eating the waste. They are the bottom feeders, the scavengers of the sea. I don't necessarily think that God created these for us to put them in our bodies. But I mean, look at this. I mean, what do we usually do? We, we toss it in boiling water, and then we smother it with We torture butter. them, the, the we lobsters. We squeeze lemon over it, and then we, we feast off of their bodies. And we're eating sewage secondhand. I don't know, but I'm not interested in those. So the Bible continues and says to abstain from things offered to idols from abstain from the blood and this is in the new testament from things strangled and from sexual immorality if you keep yourselves from these you will do well so we have similar health laws so hygiene laws that are continued why? into the new testament after christ came and ascended that's true that is but why no blood i mean was there something specific with the blood yeah, um, scientists have long known that blood carries infections and toxins that circulate in an animal's body. If people eat animal blood, they're needlessly being exposed to infections and toxins. And Leviticus um, 17.11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood carries the nutrients to the tissues. It bathes the tissues and muscle cells and organs with the nutrients and the red blood cells and the oxygen and the white blood cells. And so the blood is, is key to life and it carries, it's the pathway, it carries all these um, nutrients and, mm -hmm. and there can be toxins in them too. Um, 
Many genotoxic substances are transmitted by eating toxic flesh, such as scavengers, and the blood of any animal, animal or the fat or the cattle, sheep, or goat. Those are items God did not intend for us to eat. He did not intend for us to eat the blood of the animal or the fat of the animal. And a lot of toxins are fat-soluble. That's true. Um, Look at this. They're stored in the fat, the insecticides, the pesticides, the herbicides, antibiotics, other chemicals that the agricultural industry gives their, 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 um, their flocks and their, um, <clears throat> yeah, their, their cattle and everything. That can get stored into the fat, and a lot of people love the taste of meat because of the fat, because of the blood in it too. But there is um, a lot of toxic loads that are increasing as the years go by, we find. Which is true. So this is interesting here. Can humans become infected after eating meat or drinking milk from diseased animals? What do you think? Yes? No? What do we find? Do you remember this headline right here? So from the early or the late 80s into the early 2000s, mad cow disease was killing so many individuals. And did you know that the fat, I'm, oh. I'm sorry, I think we have a, a mix up in the slide here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so yeah, the disease, um, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the human variant of mad cow disease. It's a fatal and degenerative disorder that destroys the brain and spinal cord over time. And once you get the symptoms, it can actually kill you within um, a, a matter of a month or so. Yeah, and it could it's, actually be years before you come down with symptoms. Yes. But like you said, once you come down with the symptoms, it's extremely rapid. Yes, so it's rare, but it still it does prove the point that disease is definitely transmitted by animal flesh too. Now dairy, I mean, come on, don't let's not touch the dairy here, right? I mean, what do we see in 1970? The National Mastitis Council announced some strains of microbacteria similar to those that are associated with tuberculosis have been found to survive pasteurization. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty frightening. Um, so, oh. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping all around here. <laughs> we've, we've lost our slides. Go back this way. Let's see. Yeah. All right, so to this quote from um, Seven Testimonies, page 135, it's, it says, tell them that the time will soon come where, the, where there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because the disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. And I wanted to mention... Um, Eggs, so eggs are mentioned in this quote. There we go. Eggs, um, eggs, eggs are mentioned in this quote that there will there be a go. time where there will be no safety in these certain foods because of the increase in the wickedness of men. Um, the avian bird flu has taken out a lot of um, the poultry industry and the egg industry, it's affected them. We've seen prices in eggs increase. Um, according to the CDC, they say that there is no risk in getting avian bird flu from eating contaminated eggs. But in the same sentence, they say you need to cook the eggs at a certain temperature um, to kill any viruses. And of course, the egg farmers go to great lengths to make sure that their flock is being spared from the avian bird flu. Um, avian bird flu has been found to be contaminated by the wild birds or wild flocks that come in and, and um, mingle with the farmed birds. And 
I think that's still concerning um, because we, we've seen a report recently that the U.S. government has approved a, a gain-of-function research on avian bird flu, and they've tried to separate out and modify this flu virus to try to better understand it. But of course, that poses the risk um, that it could be used as a bioweapon and used against humans. And we have evidence, or they've actually um, purposefully modified the virus and put it into ferrets so that it can jump species. So the avian bird flu has been um, manipulated and modified so that it can affect mammals. And so there is a risk to humans from that, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> um, the other thing I wanted to point out that was interesting I found is from the toxic chemical spills. And we've heard a lot about certain toxic chemicals that have been in the news, like in East Palestine in Ohio, and how the residents there are complaining of health issues because of the pollution that has gone on. Um, this is not the first time that toxic waste has affected the public, and there are egg farmers and cattle farmers and dairy farmers, poultry farmers around that area in the Midwest too. But there was a report done off of um, Mossville, Louisiana. And a lot of the population actually relocated from Mossville after they found high levels of dioxins that were contaminated and in the public's blood levels and in they found it measurable in the eggs in that community too. Now, Mossville, Louisiana has a few um, vinyl chloride production plants and they make vinyl chloride that helps to make, um, it's used in, to make PVC, so the hard PVC pipes, and also vinyl chloride is used to make phthalates, which that's in a number of commodities um, today. And, and yeah, so this is, dioxin is a very highly toxic chemical that can really disrupt hormones, cause cancer, and so a lot of these poor people in this community of Mossville, Louisiana have, have had to relocate and they found measurable levels of these toxins in their dairy supply, unfortunately. So we see a concern with even the eggs. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many individuals love their eggs, right? Mm -hmm. And to have to give these up, that could be concerning. But what do we see here? As we look at another diet here, the manna diet, diet number four. Mm -hmm. And this is really neat here because we know that as the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they were wandering in the wilderness for how many years? For 40 years. Mm -hmm. And God gave them food. What did he give them? He gave them manna, didn't he? And we see here in Exodus 16:35 that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to the land inhabited, they ate manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. And what's interesting here is we see manna, a provision from heaven, known as angel's food or food provided by the angels, to gather it six days a week, not on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It was golden in color, they would make cakes out of it. It tasted of fresh oil. Mm -hmm. And we see here, um, it tasted like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made out of honey. Mm -hmm. A type of Christ, the bread of life. And we see here the Israelites despised the manna and they cried out for the flesh pots of Egypt. And you know what's interesting is we meet so many individuals, and I believe they're crying out for these flesh pots of Egypt. They're not wanting to give up their meat, their chicken, their bacon, their beef, their dairy products. They're not necessarily wanting to adhere to the diet that God originally gave us and established in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. But you know, Looking at the food supply that we have today, it's, it's concerning, I think, especially looking at the state of the food that it's in, right? Mm -hmm. 
But then we find something interesting, and I think this is where, where it really brings, home, brings it home for us, is because the Eden restored. This is diet number five, friends. Because what are we going to find? Look at these pictures. Look at the fruits here. What are we going to experience when we are eating at the banquet table with Christ? Are we going to be going out and killing a cow, killing chickens? I, I don't necessarily think so, right? What do we find? In Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. So these carnivores will become herbivores. Right? Mm -hmm. And what do we find in Revelation 21, verse 4? And there shall be no more death. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. God is still on his, on his throne, and it's a beautiful promise that he has for us. There will be no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow. And because of this, we're going to be eating a vegetarian, plant-based rich diet. In heaven. We're, in heaven. We're not going to be consuming the, the dead cow. You know, I don't know about you. There won't be bacon and eggs for, I don't know for about breakfast you. in heaven. Yeah. But I don't want my stomach to be a cemetery for dead animals. Right? And when you look at food and when you realize what your body, your body actually needs to survive, you find that we do very well just on plant foods. Mm -hmm. You know, I was raised as a little boy, and I remember individuals would always ask me specifically, what do you eat? Where do you get your protein? I mean, do you just eat broccoli and carrots and lettuce and that's your diet? But you know, it's amazing the variety of food that is out there and how delicious it actually is, you know? So, you know, friends, I don't necessarily know where you are at on your dietary journey. I don't know what health challenges you may have. I don't know what, what convictions you have experienced. I don't know where you are at in your lives right now. But, you know, our prayer is that this presentation will be a catalyst for you to solidify what direction you are wanting to take regarding your diet and what type of a dietary approach you are wanting to live to benefit your health. You know, we certainly find in 3 John 2, we read that it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may what? That you may prosper, prosper and, and be in, in health. health. Yes. God wants us to prosper. And it's amazing to know that we can prosper on a plant-rich diet. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. So friends, um, if in your heart you have a desire to abide by God's word, if you want to recognize the teachings of the Bible tonight, then I just ask that you pray with us this evening as we seek the Lord together. Dear Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your word, for your instructions. And dear Father, we pray that you will bless us that you will restore us and you will redeem us. We thank you for this wonderful event and the education that we are receiving. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we thank you for coming out this evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Amen. All right, well, thank you so much. Yes, and thank you for coming out despite the rain and the cold. This is our second presentation in a seven-part series. So the rest of the presentations are going to be tomorrow. We're going to have a power-packed day. It starts at 10 a.m. So we want to encourage you to be back at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll have a presentation at 10, 11. We're providing lunch. We have a free lunch. Everyone is welcome to stay and join us for that. It's going to be at 12.30. And then we've got some great presentations in the afternoon. We want to remind you about the free gift. We called it Death in the Kitchen. This is one of two free gifts we're going to give you on your way out for our friends who are watching online. If you would like to receive the little book called Death in the Kitchen, all you have to do is text the word kitchen to the number 40544 
or visit afsummit.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening.